we, the silent ones. On the shifting sands, the story written by forbidden feet. In the nomadic sky, solitary wings and a lens that spies and probes. In the jungle depths, the enemy, 36,000 strong. In our hands, shreds for evaluation. Unrelated items for conjecture. Implements of formulation. Trivia times mass squared equals victory on Bougainville. We are gathering intelligence, drawing the death plan for an island. your host, General Holland M. Smith, former commanding general, Fleet Marine Force, Pacific Area, United States Marine Corps. General Smith, was it possible to bypass the island of Bougainville? No, Bougainville could not be bypassed. In May of 1943, our growing air and naval strength forced the Imperial Japanese High Command to reevaluate its strategy. Our initial successes at Guadalcanal, Tulagi, and New Georgia in the Southern Solomon pointed our intent to fight our way up the inland route past New Guinea, the Marianas, Philippines, and into the so-called home islands of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. As a countermeasure, they elected to maintain a defense line stretching from the Aleutians through Wake, the Marshalls, Gilbert, Ocean, Nauru and the Bismarck. To hold this perimeter, they assigned the combined fleet for mobile defense with orders to engage on site any and all American land and air units. And since the southern key strong point in this defense system was Rabaul, well, the Japanese disposition of their airfields enabled them to intercept our planes and deflect our potential. Because of its strategic location, there was never any doubt that we would fight the Japanese for the island of Bougainville. It was inevitable. For 18 months, the Japanese have built and fortified. For 18 months, we have struggled for a foothold. Now the Russells, Southern Solomon, and parts of New Guinea lie behind us in our possession. From our forward bases, American bombers arm for a strike at Rabaul. by observers, the Japanese clear their fields, send a massive armada to intercept.
with a sky full of angry lead, it is inevitable. Some of our planes are shot down. in our target. The situation was intolerable. We had to neutralize and capture those athletes. We had to turn them against the enemy, and that meant we had to go in and take them the hard way by amphibious assault. Much before the battle at Guadalcanal, the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pacific were planning the battle for Raboul, of which Bougainville was a part. South of the island lie the Shortland, logical attack point for invasion. But to oppose the entrenched enemy would mean a great loss of lives, equipment, and reserve strength. Enemy strength by the thousand was concentrated around the airfield. Where then could we strike, secure a foothold, fill an airfield, and dig in? Choiseul Island, south and east of Bougainville. Logical, and therefore to be expected by the enemy. Furthermore, it will delay the entire Solomon's campaign. Moreover, from Choiseul, our fighter planes do not have the range to protect our bombers to Rabaul and return. Re-evaluation. Seize and hold the Treasury Islands, northern Empress Augusta Bay, and construct airfields there. Seize and hold Choiseul Bay area, install radar, staging and PT points thereat. Objection. Aerial reconnaissance reveals that Buka is beyond fighter-bomber escort range. Kahili is within range, but is too strongly defended. It would cost more lives to take it than its strategic worth. The Shortlands have narrow beaches completely unsuitable for a landing under heavy resistance. Further objection. Any approach to invasion on the east coast will lengthen and delay 
expose our inadequate surface tonnage to greater possibility of attack and remove it from retreat to friendly air cover in case of naval action with the Japanese 8th Fleet. The final analysis read, tactical and logistical considerations fix uh, Empress Augusta Bay on the west coast of Bougainville as our final objective. Intelligence units go into operation on a skill heretofore impossible. Ground units transported by a submarine to suitable landing points on Ono and Sterling Island in the Treasury Group. Others will proceed by PT boat to Choiselle Island. So, if no land contemplated there. Good old American problem. If the Japanese find evidence of our presence, they will misinterpret our intentions. We will use Choiselle as a feint to deliver the knockout blow elsewhere. Prime patrols will scout Bougainville, observing and mapping the terrain, Japanese installation, strength, connecting trails, and general ground conditions. In the Kieda and Numa Numa areas, seaplanes are used. Offshore, naval parties sound and map the coastline. Depth, average rise and fall with the tides, submerged reefs, obstacles, and beach depth. And for a period of several weeks, Marine, Navy, and army personnel roam, photograph, scout, spy upon, and elude an enemy who boasts of his superiority. Photo recon planes roam the length and breadth of the Solomon Group. Trails, rivers, mountains, enemy emplacements, all are photographed. This open space is unsuitable for an airfield because the mountains at either end make it hazardous. But this area is completely suitable and can be bulldozed, planed, filled, graded, surfaced, and in operation within 30 days. As the information is digested at Guadalcanal, certain facts become fault, and certain faults become fact. The coastlines are as much as 10 miles removed from their location on existing maps. Waters charted as safe actually hide the shallow presence of dangerous reefs, shoals, and peaks. The night landings under contemplation have to be abandoned. We will assault in daylight so the ships will not run afoul of these obstructions. Aerial photographs show no troop movements toward the Empress Augusta Bay area. All enemy activity is centered near his airfield in anticipation of an all-out frontal assault. He is not expecting attack on the East Coast. He has not guessed our intention. Then in October 1943, Coast Watchers get the word through there are anti-aircraft emplacements and slit trenches being constructed in the Empress Augusta Bay area. From a submarine, we land another patrol.
scouting report is reassuring. Routine installations and no concentration of troops in the scheduled landing area. This means the troops will have to go ashore in smaller echelons. Can we risk this? Will enemy strength be sufficient to overwhelm our initial waves? No. Intelligence reports are re-evaluated. Torikina points geographic location, dictates the use of localized units and small detachments. Can the enemy bring up his reserves in time to destroy our initial beachhead? No. Existing trails are inadequate, and no military road exists for rapid reinforcement. Can they reinforce from the sea? No. Our air cover will obviate that possibility. Can their fleet reach us in time to jeopardize the operation? No. It is in Rabul, 10 hours away. Rehearsals will be held in the new Hebrides Islands at Afati, and will continue until the assault and unloading can be accomplished within six hours, allowing four hours for the safe withdrawal of our craft. Army, Navy, and Marine Air Squadrons will converge from all existing bases within range of the operation and will be scheduled to give constant maximum protection against anticipated enemy strikes. To inactivate a maximum number of enemy planes, bombing missions will be scheduled in advance of D-Day to destroy both grounded aircraft and runways. On D-Day, naval units will concentrate their fire upon the attended landing areas and strong points. High-level bombing missions will be flown closely followed by low-level strikes and straightings. The task forces will furnish cover for the amphibious landing. As diversionary measures to screen our real intent, the combined air forces will seek out and engage all Japanese naval units within the area, and a bombing mission will be sent over above. secondary assault at Choiseul. This will draw his attention to the south and prevent his reinforcing the Bougainville area from his southern forces. Task Unit A-1, 3rd Marine Division, reinforced, organized into four landing teams, embarks October 13 from Tetere, Guadalcanal. Cargo for each team, 520 tons. From 16 to 20th October, they engage in rehearsals. Maps of their objective are studied, enemy strong points located, and methods evolved for neutralizing them. When each man, in each squad, in each platoon, in each company, knows his part in the operation, they go ashore and put into practice what they have absorbed in theory. Task Unit A2, 9th Marines reinforced, stages their rehearsal 18 to 25 October. And Task Unit A3, 3rd Defense Battalion, conducts its operations at Guadalcanal 26-29 October.
units of the attack force rendezvous 84 miles west of Guadalcanal at 0740, 31 October. Eight months of planning, evaluating, gathering intelligence, men, supplies, and materiel are over. The admirals, the generals, the strategists of command have finished. With their sweat, they have planned battle. With the unceasing diligence of their skepticism, they have refined it, improved it, reduced its flaws to the lowest possible minimum. From compassion, they have chosen the course which offers the greatest possible chance of survival to their comrades, the officers and men of the Marine Corps who serve under them. From necessity, they have accepted inadequate sinews of war. By placement and superior utilization, they have multiplied their strength a hundredfold. Before the Almighty God, who has been, and is, and must ever be the mainstay of our free nation, they bow their heads, thankful for whatever portion he has inspired in their final plan for victory.